Section 15 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 15 Reports and Folios. The many geological studies published in annual reports, monographs, bulletins, and folios exhibit admirably the work of individual members of the survey, but they reflect credit also on the director, who knew how to select good associates and who wisely trusted them with great responsibilities and gave them great liberty of action. Powell, indeed, had so much native capacity that he never hesitated, as a weaker director might have done, to employ men who knew more geology than he did himself. The correlation papers, prepared according to a general plan by eleven specialists under Gilbert's supervision to summarize knowledge regarding successive geological periods, contributed greatly to a broad understanding of large problems, and these papers constitute a thoroughly characteristic product of Powell's administration. The annual volumes, giving statistical summaries of mineral resources, also deserve special mention as initiated under Powell's direction. They are probably as accurate as possible under the conditions of their preparation, but they are probably not so accurate as they appear to be. The geologic folios, containing sheets of the geological map of the United States, which the survey had been instructed to prepare, are based on a uniform and comprehensive plan and exhibit, like the topographic maps, Powell's remarkable foresight and breadth of view. The plan for the publication of the folios was carefully discussed in several conferences of leading geologists. Careful debate was given to the general explanatory text of the cover, to the scheme of coloring, so admirably carried into effect by the engraving department of the survey, and to the liberal presentation of topography, geology, structure, and economic features on separate sheets, all this being told in the 10th Annual Report, 1888-1889. The first geologic folio was issued in 1892, 13 years after the establishment of the survey. Later folios show marked improvement in various directions, the text in particular becoming more elaborate and pictorial illustrations were abundant but the original plan is still followed, except for the inevitable departure from the intention that the text should be so prepared as to be intelligible to users who are not trained geologists. This feature of the plan has not been carried out, and cannot be carried out unless a great part of the laborious and expensive accumulation of scientific fact and inference is not published in direct connection with the geological map to which it so closely applies. Certain critics have questioned whether another form of publication than a large folio would not be more generally useful, and some folios have lately been prepared in the form of bulletins with folded maps for field use. But for purposes of study in every other place than on the ground, the folio form introduced under Powell is the most convenient. If the whole series of folios, when completed, proves to be a heavy care for any library, this must be charged against the glorious misfortune of our large national area. End of section 15. Section 16 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902, to by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 16. Irrigation Survey The Tenth Annual Report tells of the Irrigation Survey, instituted in 1888 as a Department of the Geological Survey, for the determination of the extent to which arid districts can be redeemed by irrigation and for the selection of sites for reservoirs, but not the construction of irrigation works. This was a fitting, though a delayed, consequence of the report on the arid lands ten years earlier. 
but it added a heavy weight to the duties of the director and probably led to the appointment of Gilbert in 1889 and later of Walcott as chief geologist. The establishment of the irrigation survey must be regarded as having been prompted by Powell himself, for he had continually urged upon Congress the necessity of making appropriations for such investigations, and had delivered addresses and written magazine articles on the same subject. Although the irrigation work was cut off in 1892, much progress in this direction was accomplished, as attested first by the growth for several years and the size of the special annual reports on irrigation problems, and 14 years later by the establishment of the Reclamation Service. And all this must be credited to Powell's initiative and to the enthusiasm that he aroused in the younger men whom he selected to carry on the work. End of section 16. Section 17 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 17. Administration. The various aspects of the geological survey here summarized from successive volumes of annual reports reflect clearly enough the character impressed on this great organization by Powell as its director, but they give a very imperfect picture of the labor demanded of him in maintaining the survey. A governmental bureau depends on one side upon the annual appropriations of a changing Congress and on the other side upon the loyal and expert work of its many members. The continuation of such a bureau and the fate of its members might be left by a philosophical outsider entirely to the wisdom of congressmen because, in the abstract, the Bureau exists only to carry out the will of the people as expressed by their representatives. But in the concrete case of any single Bureau, especially of a Bureau originally established for the performance of a great and long-enduring task, many other considerations enter into the problem, as Powell well knew, and weighty among these is a reasonable assurance of steady employment for those who have in good faith cast their lot in the work of the Bureau, with a fair expectation of its long existence, and also an honorable ambition of the director regarding the distant completion of the important task committed to his charge, already begun or planned for the immediate future. Not only general continuity of work, but steadiness and rate of work, or at least the avoidance of a decreasing rate, is essential for an employee's peace of mind and a director's satisfaction. Increase may be welcomed, but retrenchment is at once an embarrassment to the director who is compelled to execute it and a hardship to those upon whom it is executed. The approach of the critical season when congressional appropriations are usually voted is, therefore, unavoidably a time of anxiety for the members of a bureau in which the work necessarily changes to some extent every year, for some members must lose their positions if the work is reduced, and it is a particularly anxious time to the director, upon whom the responsibility for maintaining the bureau so largely depends, all the more so to a director who, like the major, felt a deep personal solicitude for the welfare of his fellow workers, as if they were members of his family. The internal organization of a scientific bureau is, as compared to this external responsibility, an enjoyable pastime to an able director surrounded by loyal associates. One can indeed feel, when looking over the annual administrative reports of the Geological Survey, that Powell had a lively pleasure in the internal part of his work, and the same impression was given to visitors who, from time to time, heard him humming a tune as he made his way through the corridors of the survey building to look at the work of some of his staff. If one may judge by the years of rapidly ascending development of the survey from 1881 to 1892, when Powell's staunch friends in Congress acted so heartily upon his suggestions and 
gave him practically every opportunity that he asked for. He had, during that notable period, as small a share of external anxiety as the head of a great bureau can expect. Yet it must not be overlooked that during this famous decade of geological evolution, no small amount of Powell's time was demanded in presenting his plans, even to the more friendly members of congressional committees, and no small measure of skill and patience was needed in winning the support of the less friendly members. But Powell was master here, as well as in a boat trip down the Colorado. He had enthusiasm for the work to be accomplished. He was deeply impressed with its great importance in the development of the country. He was honest in his presentation of its merits. Moreover, he understood human nature pretty well and knew how to deal with men of many kinds. And he had so full command of all pertinent facts that his opponents in congressional committees were often left with nothing but their opposition to stand on. He doubtless deserved the reputation gained in the minds of persons long acquainted with Washington affairs of being, for the first ten years of his directorate, eminently successful in accomplishing what he set out to accomplish, and in securing such congressional enactments and appropriations as he wished to secure. Naturally, therefore, the growth of the geological survey was phenomenal, it began with an appropriation of $100,000 and with 39 members on its payroll for the year ending June 30, 1880. For 1881-82, the first full year of Powell's directorate, the figures were $156,000 and 50. In 1890-1891, the maximum appropriation of $719,000 was reached. The next year, there was a moderate decrease to $631,000. This unrivaled development was accompanied by a swelling volume of publications of all kinds. It is not too much to say that the eyes of the geological world were turned in astonished admiration at so unprecedented an expansion, which had rapidly brought the United States Geological Survey under Powell's leadership to be not only the largest organization of its kind, but the largest scientific organization of any kind in the world. Instead of Philadelphia, as at first suggested, Washington became the inevitable place of meeting for the International Geological Congress of 1891. At the close of the Western excursion that followed the Congress, Powell led a party of visiting geologists across the Arizona Plateau to the Colorado Canyon, and seemed to enjoy giving the European members a sample of the rough conditions under which travel had then to be prosecuted in the far west. The following winter, the Cuvier Prize was fittingly awarded to the collective work of the survey by the Academy of Sciences of Paris. End of section 17. Section 18 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 18. Resignation from the Survey. But even up to this time, all had not been clear sailing in Washington. Already, in 1884, opposition to the rapid growth of the survey instigated, it is said, by some of those who were left out of the government service in the reorganization of 1879, had arisen in Congress. The Joint Commission, above referred to, was its outcome. Powell's testimony disclosed, however, so perfect an organization, he showed himself so completely in control of it, and his statement traversing certain averments made by members of the opposing minority in Congress, was so satisfying to his friends in the majority that he came out victorious from the ordeal. The appropriation of nearly half a million for the survey for the year ending June 30, 1885, was, in the face of the organized opposition, raised to little over half a million for 1885-1886, and so continued for the next two years. 
it was raised to six hundred and five thousand dollars for eighteen eighty eight eighteen eighty nine reduced to five hundred and fifty one thousand dollars for eighteen eighty nine eighteen ninety and reached the maximum of seven hundred and nineteen thousand dollars for eighteen ninety eighteen ninety one the decrease of nearly ninety thousand dollars for the following year marked the opening of a period of adversity which culminated in the summer of eighteen ninety two the establishment of the irrigation survey four years before had aroused the opposition of large landowners and cattle kings in the west a result that was not unexpectable when the scientific administration of a public bureau in the interest of the country as a whole clashed with the personal interest of men who were rapidly growing rich under the unrestricted use of public resources and unhappily at about the same time powell's wounded arm gave him much pain the suffering thus caused made it difficult for him to labor with congressional committees as successfully as he had before the first successful stroke of the opposition was made in eighteen ninety one not only by the reduction of the appropriation for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen ninety two as noted above but further by the assignment of definite sums for the salaries of designated members of the survey and for special branches of work work on irrigation was not mentioned and was therefore suspended the following year was nothing less than disastrous the appropriation for the year ending june thirtieth eighteen ninety three voted at the late date of august fifth eighteen ninety two fell to four hundred and thirty thousand dollars definite sums were assigned to work and salaries as before but now fourteen stated salaries were discontinued and at the same time the amount of money assigned to topographic surveys was so large a part of the total that the balance left for geology was scanty field work was in active progress by a number of divisions of the geological branch when this blow fell it was stopped by telegraphic orders and the workers were directed to prepare records already in hand for publication or at least to put their material into systematic shape so that it might be used later many salaries that were not cut off entirely were seriously reduced some members of the survey voluntarily worked through the following winter on small pay or no pay it was a time of distress the next year the appropriation was raised to nearly five hundred thousand dollars but the volume in which this is announced opens with a page from powell to his collaborators taking leave of them his resignation to take effect june thirtieth eighteen ninety four had been announced some months before the burden of his work had grown and its difficulties had been aggravated by antagonism his poor health did not allow him to suffer the irritation of conflicts his withdrawal from the survey was made necessary by painful disability and he devoted himself thenceforward to the simpler duties of the bureau of ethnology of which he continued to be the chief powell's administration of the survey was extraordinary in many respects he was a strong independent and aggressive leader as was to be expected in view of his freely expressed indifference to traditions and conventionalities he was truly a director by nature and so confident of his power that he never hesitated to appoint able men as his subordinates his authority was maintained without resort to the formalities of rank indeed he replaced with a jovial comradeship the lofty inaccessibility not unknown in some official bureaus american as well as european he had a keen sense of justice i well remember the outburst of indignation with which he replied at a scientific meeting to a speaker who had referred unfairly to the work of an absent colleague he felt a warm personal interest in the work of his associates more than one junior has felt the cheer of his sympathetic appreciation he attached the members of the survey to its service and secured their devoted and loyal support because he was helpful trustful and encouraging to them when he was convinced that he had good grounds for being so 
he felt a personal solicitude for the future of the workers in the survey that outlasted his directorship. Withdrawal from office, under a sense of disappointment, was a sad ending to the vast work of creation and organization that Powell had guided almost from its beginning. But he had at least, in the decade that followed, the satisfaction of seeing the return of the survey to a period of growth and prosperity under the direction of his successor, who had long been associated with him, and to whom at the end of a difficult piece of work ten years earlier he had said, the older man, putting his one arm around the younger, My boy, you have done well. I hope you will stay with us. End of section 18「Section 19 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 19. Residence in Washington. We may here introduce between the accounts of Powell's work in geology and in ethnology a brief statement of his personal relations with his associates and of his large share in organizing and supporting scientific societies in the national capital. His Washington home at 910 M Street Northwest was for many years recognized as a scientific center not only for employees under his charge, but for the scientific men of Washington in general. It was in his parlor that the Cosmos Club was organized in 1878. He was then made its temporary president and became formally the president of the permanent organization on January 10, 1881. The club has now more than 600 resident and 350 non-resident members, and includes therein most of the representatives of science, literature, and art in the national capital. Through the winter of 1883, an informal reception was held in Major Powell's parlor every Sunday evening for the members of the Geological Survey and Bureau of Ethnology, but these receptions soon grew too large to permit of their continuation. Powell's large share in developing non-official scientific interest in Washington may be inferred from his relation to the following societies, most of which have their seat in the national capital. He held at one time or another membership in the Anthropological Society of Washington, of which he was a founder, and also president in 1879 to 1882, 1883 to 85, 1887, and 1895. In the American Anthropological Association, of which he was a founder. In the Washington Academy of Sciences, of which he was an incorporator and vice president. In the National Geographic Society, of which he was an incorporator. In the American Association for the Advancement of Science, of which he was president in 1888 in the National Academy of Sciences, in the Philosophical, the Biological, the Chemical, and the Geological Societies of Washington, in the Geological Society of America, of which he was one of the first counselors, and in the American Folklore Society. He was known to be an associate member of the Société d'Anthropologie of Paris, and a corresponding member of the Berliner Gesellschaft for Anthropology, Ethnology, und Urgeschichte. But whether this completes the list of his foreign membership, it has been impossible to determine. End of section 19. Section 20 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 20. Ethnological Work. Although Powell is probably known to a greater number of persons as a geologist than as an ethnologist, his publications on ethnology and anthropology, and on the philosophical problems into which the study of these sciences led him, 
are apart from purely administrative reports twice as numerous as those on geology and it appears that his contributions to the content of the sciences of earth and of man stand in about the same proportion his active interest in ethnology began when he came into contact with the Indian tribes of western Colorado and eastern Utah in the summer of 1868. It was probably reinforced by Secretary Henry's advice that special study of the Indians should be made during the canyon journey of the next year. But more important than its origin is the nature of the interest that Powell felt in ethnology, for it had the merit of being characterized by a willingness to recognize other standards than those of the civilized races of mankind, by a ready capacity to appreciate the position of the other fellow, and by a sincere respect for humanity in all its stages of development. These are largely matters of temperament, not of learning. They are of prime importance to an ethnologist in the office as well as in the field. Gilbert gave emphasis to this point when he wrote that Powell, quote, realized, as perhaps few had realized before him, that the point of view of the savage is essentially different from that of the civilized man, that just as his music cannot be recorded in the notation of civilized music, just as his words cannot be written with the English alphabet, so the structure of his language transcends the formula of the Aryan grammars, and his philosophy and social organization follow lines unknown to the European. End quote. The warm hearted sympathy that was the basis of Powell's success in the field study of Indian tribes is nowhere better illustrated than in the comment he makes on the fate of the three men who left his party and climbed out of the Colorado Canyon in August 1869 as already briefly narrated. The story was learned a year later by Jacob Hamblin, a Mormon missionary among the Indians who spoke their language well and had great influence among them, and who was with Powell's party in the summer of 1870 on the plateau north of the canyon, not far from the point where the three men had ascended from the river the year before. Quote, they came upon the Indian village almost starved and exhausted with fatigue. They were supplied with food and put on their way to the settlements. Shortly after they had left, an Indian from the east side of the Colorado arrived at the village and told them about a number of miners having killed a squaw in a drunken brawl, and no doubt these were the men. No person had ever come down the canyon. That was impossible. They were trying to hide their guilt. In this way, he worked them into a great rage. They followed, surrounded the men in ambush, and filled them full of arrows. End quote. Powell's comment on this pitiful story contains not a thought of revenge or even of punishment. He realized that primitive and advanced men do not think alike, and he respected the Indian's idea of justice. Quote, that night I slept in peace. Although these murderers of my men and their friends, the Uin Carets, were sleeping not five hundred yards away. While we were gone to the canyon, the pack train and supplies, enough to make an Indian rich beyond his wildest dreams, were all left in their charge and were all safe. Not even a lump of sugar was pilfered by the children. End quote. Colorado River, 130-131. Some years later, Powell explicitly stated his creed in this matter, quote, When I stand before the sacred fire in an Indian village and listen to the red man's philosophy, no anger stirs my blood. I love him as one of my kind. End quote. Philosophical Bearings of Darwinism, Washington, 1882, page 12. Powell's interest in Indian customs and languages was at first combined with some attention to problems in the practical administration of Indian affairs. He was appointed by Congress in 1872, 
a commissioner to examine the condition of certain tribes in the far west, and his report, made jointly with G. W. Ingalls, was his first ethnological publication, 1874. It was at this time that he discussed the causes and remedies for the inevitable conflict that arises from the spread of civilization over a region previously inhabited by savages. But in his later studies, the Indians, unmodified by contact with the whites, were his subject. Secretary Henry of the Smithsonian Institution, who had early given Powell encouragement and assistance in the direction of ethnology, was greatly impressed with the exploration of the Colorado. Regarding the report upon which he later wrote, quote, The whole work will do honor to the appreciation by the government of scientific information of this kind, as well as of the ability and perseverance of Professor Powell and his assistants. End quote. It was evidently on the basis of this good opinion that, after Powell had turned from geology to ethnology in the early 70s, much material collected by the Smithsonian Institution was placed in his hands. This included 670 Indian vocabularies, which had previously been submitted to Trumbull, and it was upon this extended basis that Powell prepared his first Introduction to the Study of Indian Languages, 1877, an enlarged edition of which was published three years later. End of section 20. Section 21 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902 by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 21 Bureau of Ethnology. A natural consequence of all this was that when the Bureau of Ethnology was organized by Act of Congress in 1879, Powell was made its director, a post which he held with great distinction for 23 years. He entered upon these duties with the expectation of devoting the rest of his life to them, for at that time he had given up all thought of continuing his geological studies. Yet only two years later he was at the head of the geological survey, as has already been told. It is astonishing that he could, for a period of twelve years, so ably direct both these important organizations. It is natural enough that, after having resigned his place as director of the geological survey in 1894, he should continue until the end of his life in charge of his other and less onerous duties. If the Bureau of Ethnology did not reach the ideal development that he had contemplated and hoped, it nevertheless gained a highly respected scientific position. It was administered at no great cost. The appropriations ran from $20,000 at the outset to $50,000 in the last year of Powell's administration. The appropriation bill sometimes contained the thrifty item that not exceeding $1,000 may be used for rent of building. The object of the Bureau, as defined in its reports, was the prosecution of research by the direct employment of scholars and specialists in the Bureau itself, and by the promotion of research by collaborators elsewhere through the country. As far as the general progress of ethnology was concerned, Powell's great service here, as in geology, lay in organizing a corps of experts and providing opportunity for their steady work under good conditions in directing their work wisely and in securing assurance of fitting publication for their results. In the opinion of an experienced Washington official, Powell worked little less than a revolution in educating Congress to bring the trained scientific expert into government research. Twenty-three large volumes of annual reports of the Bureau, issued under Powell's direction, mark an epoch in American ethnology. But besides organizing this important Bureau, Powell took a leading part in its work. He gave much thought for many years, as well as all the time that he could spare, to problems connected with the life and customs of the American Indian. His favorite subjects for essays and addresses 
were chosen from topics of the same nature and from the philosophical problems to which they led. End of section 21. Section 22 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 22 Indian Languages and Mythology. Powell's attention was early turned to the speech of Indian tribes because he felt that a knowledge of languages was fundamental in gaining an understanding of other and more important characteristics, namely, thoughts and acts as embodied in customs, institutions, and religions. An elaborate bibliography of North American philology was undertaken by his associate, Pilling, and Powell himself gave much time to the study of Indian tongues in the field and office. The monograph on Indian linguistic families, to which these studies led, is further considered below. In the first annual report of the Bureau of Ethnology for 1879-1880, published in 1881, Powell's strong bent toward the treatment of problems in generalized form is indicated by his discussing so large a subject as the evolution of language in an essay that had previously served him as presidential address before the Anthropological Society of Washington in 1880. It treats the specialization of the grammatic processes, the differentiation of the parts of speech, and the integration of the sentence and affords profitable reading for persons of classical training, because it opens up surprising possibilities in the way of linguistic structure to which the languages of Europe are strangers. Quote, Many conditions and qualifications appear in the verb of the Indian languages, which in English and other civilized languages appear as adverbs in adverbial phrases and clauses. End quote. Again, Indian verbs often express a larger meaning than we are accustomed to compress into a single word. Thus, quote, the English verb to go may be represented in an Indian language by a word signifying to go home, another go away from home, another go to a place other than home, one to go up, another to go down, another go up a valley, another go up a river. But it is in the genders of the article pronouns that the greatest difficulty may be found. The student must entirely free his mind of the idea that gender is simply a distinction of sex. Often by these genders all objects are classified by characteristics found in their attributes or supposed constitution, Thus we may have the animate and inanimate, one or both, divided into the standing, the sitting, and the lying, or they may be divided into the watery, the mushy, the earthy, the stony, the woody, and the fleshy. End quote. The extracts quoted below indicate some of the chief conclusions reached, and at the same time point out Powell's practical view of linguistic evolution a view as natural in a man of his surroundings and training as it would be unnatural in a graduate of Eton and Oxford. It is worthy of remark, he writes, that all paradigmatic inflection in a civilized tongue is a relic of its barbarous condition. When the parts of speech are fully differentiated and the process of placement fully specialized, so that the order of words and sentences has its full significance, no useful purpose is subserved by inflection. Page 15. He insisted that inflection is not economical, because, quote, the speaker is compelled, in the choice of a word to express his idea, to think of a multiplicity of things which have no connection with that which he wishes to express page 16. Thus judged, quote, English stands alone in the highest rank, but as a written language, in the way in which its alphabet is used, the English has but emerged from a barbaric condition, 
page 16. He later returns to the same topic. Men with linguistic superstitions mourn the degeneracy of English, German, and French without being aware of the great improvement which has been made in them as instruments for the expression of thought. 20th Annual Report, 1898-99, 1903, page 152. After reading these extracts, it is hardly necessary to add that Powell was an advocate of the introduction of simplified spelling, for the distinction between its advocates and its opponents is almost wholly a matter of temperament, not of learning. The first annual report of the Bureau also contains one of Powell's earliest philosophical essays entitled Sketch of the Mythology of the North American Indians, which he had read as a vice presidential address before a section of the American Association for the Advancement of Science in 1879, under the title of Mythologic Philosophy. Its headings are The Genesis of Philosophy, two grand stages of philosophy, mythologic philosophy has four stages, and so on. From the second heading, the following characteristic aphorism may be quoted. Quote, the unknown known is the philosophy of savagery. The known unknown is the philosophy of civilization. End quote. And then comes an exclamatory apostrophe, as if in scorn of our self-sufficiency. Quote, ye men of science, ye wise fools, ye have discovered the law of gravity, but ye cannot tell what gravity is. But savagery has a cause and a method for all things. Nothing is left unexplained. Pages 21, 22, and 29. End of section 22. Section 23 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 23 Savagery, Barbarism, and Civilization. Powell's capacity to frame concise summaries of elaborate studies is well illustrated in a brief characterization of savagery, barbarism, and civilization, in which he summarizes the chief points of his addresses on From Savagery to Barbarism and From Barbarism to Civilization, and out of which the following extracts are taken, with some rearrangement. Quote, the age of savagery is the age of stone. The age of barbarism is the age of clay. The age of civilization is the age of iron. The age of savagery is the age of kinship clan, when maternal kinship is held most sacred. The age of barbarism is the age of kinship tribes, when paternal kinship is held most sacred. The age of civilization is the age of nations, when territorial boundaries are held most sacred. The age of savagery is the age of sentence words. The age of barbarism is the age of phrase words. The age of civilization is the age of idea words. In savagery, music is only rhythm. In barbarism, it is rhythm and melody. In civilization, it is rhythm, melody, and harmony. In savagery, picture writings are used. In barbarism, hieroglyphics. In civilization, alphabets. In savagery, beast polytheism prevails. In barbarism, nature polytheism. In civilization, monotheism. In savagery, a wolf is an oracular god. In barbarism, it is a howling beast. In civilization, it is a connecting link in systematic zoology. In savagery, the powers of nature are feared as evil demons. In barbarism, the powers of nature are worshipped as gods. In civilization, the powers of nature are apprenticed servants. 
In savagery men can only count. In barbarism they have arithmetic. In civilization they understand geometry. In savagery the beasts are gods. In barbarism the gods are men. In civilization men are as gods, knowing good from evil. Quote, from Barbarism to Civilization, American Anthropology, 1, 1888, pages 97 to 123. End of section 23. Section 24 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 24. Synthetic Essays. It should be borne in mind that Powell's adoption of a generalized or synthetic style of presentation for the articles here cited, and for many others, was by no means because he had no command of other styles. He was capable of writing admirable narrative as was early shown in his famous report on the voyage to the Colorado Canyon. He could present a difficult problem argumentatively and with rare common sense, as is evident from his memorable Report on the Lands of the Arid Regions. He published in much detail the long stories and myths that he gathered with painstaking care from his Indian friends. He set forth in a carefully analyzed form the system of tribal government of the Wyandotte, and he had the patience and perseverance necessary for elaborate induction, as will appear when we consider his monograph on Indian linguistic families. Yet his usual method of writing, especially in his later years, consisted in the synthetic exposition of large problems, without the citation of sources or the mention of particular instances but with abundant imagery and seemingly overabundant reiteration. It may be well believed that pressure of work was in large measure responsible for these peculiarities of composition. He was ever ready to draw off a generous flood from his great reservoir of knowledge, but he had no time to trace the flood back to its spring of supply. Powell's liking for generalization had been early shown in his classification of valleys and in his treatment of the broad principle of the base level of erosion. But in these two problems he was dealing with inorganic factors, which behave in the same way the world over. In ethnological problems, on the other hand, no one continent affords a sufficient base for all embracing conclusions of the kind that one frequently meets in Powell's essays, and hence a reader who did not look farther than the printed page might infer that the conclusions there stated were sometimes broader than their foundation. Such a misjudgment would, however, only show that Powell's synthetic style of presentation did not reflect his habitual method of investigation. Most of his essays give no direct indication of the extended observation and the abundant reading on which their conclusions rest, for Powell was a profound believer in the scientific method of investigation, which regards the observation of visible facts as the essential first step in the approach to theoretical inferences as to invisible facts, and which finds in frequent return to observation the only means of verifying the correctness of the theoretical inferences. He had a great confidence in the results thus gained and accepted their guidance wherever they led. A reader of the synthetic essays may sometimes feel not only that their author does not adduce a sufficient number of facts for the support of the generalizations to which he rapidly rises, but that he not infrequently passes over from induction of generalizations to deduction of consequences from them without giving sufficient notice of his passage. For this reason, his essays do not necessarily carry conviction to one who is uninformed of the patient research by the rigorous methods of science that lay behind them. Evidently, in such case, 
the failure to carry conviction should not be charged to insufficient investigation on Powell's part, but rather to the condensed form of presentation which he was forced to adopt, alike by his many original ideas, which called for expression, and by his many administrative duties that called for execution. The absence of citations may, furthermore, contribute to a feeling that some of his essays are too speculative, for in these modern days of international acquaintance it has become the fashion for an author to give the source and authority of every statement that lies outside his own responsibility. But Powell did not read French or German, and his method of work did not allow him to follow this fashion, even if he cared to, and he probably did not care to. He had learned his lesson, and it was the lesson, not the textbook, that interested him. Footnotes and references to sources are wanting in nearly all of his publications. If he had attempted to cite authorities with any completeness, he would never have had time to finish his work. Hence, when one of his addresses presents an evident inference in the form of an observed fact, for example, quote, the primary and principal source of disagreement among primitive men at the inception of organized society grew out of their desires for the possession of women. End quote. Presidential Address, Outlines of Sociology, Anthropological Society of Washington, 1, 1882, page 116, and cites no evidence in support of it. We must understand that the object for which the address was prepared made bibliographic completeness unnecessary, and that the conditions under which it was prepared made such completeness impossible. Sometimes the inferential nature of adopted conclusions is more explicitly set forth, as in the following extracts regarding the primitive condition of mankind, which form a summary for several paragraphs of more detailed statement. Quote, it will thus be seen that from the five great coordinate departments of anthropology, in other words, from somatology, technology, sociology, philology, and philosophy, we arrive at the common conclusion that man was widely scattered throughout the earth at some early period in his history in a very low state of culture, that in such state he utilized the materials at hand, the loose stones of the earth, the shells stranded on the shores, the broken trunks and branches of trees, and we further discover that he was organized into small tribes, doubtless scattered by every bay and inlet of the seas, along the shores of all the inland lakes, and every bend of the great rivers, and on every creek of the habitable earth. Arts, institutions, languages, and philosophies have therefore a vast multiplicity of origins, and in tracing the outlines of their history, we trace the change from multiplicity toward unity. Human Evolution, Transactions of Anthropology Society of Washington, 2, 1883, pages 181-182. Even in this instance, the last sentence falls into the more habitual form of assertion, although with little danger of being misunderstood because of the context. It must, however, be recognized that in certain other cases, the presentation of an inference in the guise of a fact is carried dangerously far. It is very probably true that, quote, attitudes of the body developed into gestures and sound-making into oral speech, and the active organs of language were specialized, and, finally, oral speech, to a large extent, superseded gesture speech." Quote. And yet, even if true, it is nonetheless an inference. One may agree that, quote, each minute structure within the body is in part the same as the antecedent structure, and in part changed therefrom, by the force of impressions from without, and that it is in this manner that impressions are recorded so that the structure itself is a product of all coexistent and antecedent agencies. End quote. 
but it is a long step then to assert, without qualification, out of this arises memory. Human Evolution, Presidential Address, Anthropological Society of Washington, 2, 1883, pages 184 and 187. End of section 24. Section 25 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 25 Mannerisms. Powell's independence and originality are seen not only in his novel treatment of scientific problems, but also in certain peculiarities in his style and writing. He had a marked liking for unusual words such as acculturation and intellection. He seemed to regard the adjective termination, al, as superfluous. It is retained in the five syllable adjective of the United States Geological Survey because the title of the survey was fixed by congressional enactment but it is dropped from the geologic atlas of the United States and from the geologic and paleontologic branches of the survey, although retained in the physical and chemical branches. We have already seen that he liked to cast geographical phrases in striking forms. Other examples are, quote, the lightnings that flash athwart the sky, the coal mine is but a pot of pickled sunbeams. And then the egg of poetry is laid. End quote. He was particularly fond of reiterating a standard phrase form in which changes are rung on a variable element. Quote, it is a wonder that the blows of the hammer are transmuted into heat. It is a wonder that the motions of the ether can be transmuted into the rainbow. It is a wonder that the egg can be transmuted into the eagle. It is a wonder that the babe can be transmuted into the sage. It is a wonder that an objective blow can be transmuted into a subjective pain. It is a wonder that the vibrations of the air may be transmuted into melody. It is a wonder that the printed page may be transmuted into visions of the beautiful. Human Evolution, Transactions of Anthropological Society of Washington, 2, page 208. Reiteration of this kind can hardly have been selected as a thought-saving device, such as makes for the evolution of language, nor would it appear to possess seductive value whereby a reader's attention is enthralled instead of fatigued. It must be regarded as one of those mannerisms by which originality sometimes overreaches itself, for it turns attention to the phrasing rather than to the content of the phrasing. End of section 25. Section 26 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834-1902, to by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 26. Views on Evolution. Powell was inevitably an evolutionist, fully convinced of the gradual development of the existing order of things from an earlier order. He maintained, however, that organic evolution, as ordinarily understood, should be limited to progress in bodily organs and functions, and that human evolution is progress in culture, in which such phrases as the struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest have no application. Yet to natural evolutionary processes he ascribed the development of all mental qualities with their marvelous progress from the lower to the higher, among which, quote, the wonder of wonders is the transfiguration of selfishness into love, end quote. Human Evolution, Transaction of Anthropological Society of Washington, 2, 1883, page 208. 
He repeatedly returned to the insufficience of the struggle for existence in human development. Quote, in anthropic combinations, the units are men, and men at this stage are no longer passive objects but active subjects, and instead of man being passively adapted to the environment, he adapts the environment to himself through his activities. This is the essential characteristic of anthropic evolution. Adaptation becomes active instead of passive. It has been shown that man does not compete with the lower animals for existence. In like manner, man does not compete with man for existence. For by the development of activities, men are interdependent in such a manner that the welfare of one depends upon the welfare of others. And as men discover that welfare must necessarily be mutual, egoism is transmitted into altruism, and moral sentiments are developed which become the guiding principle of mankind. So morality repeals the law of the survival of the fittest in the struggle for existence, and man is thus immeasurably superior to the beast. In animal evolution many are sacrificed for the benefit of the few. Among mankind the welfare of one depends upon the welfare of all, because interdependence has been established. End quote. The Three Methods of Evolution, Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, 6, 1883, 48, and 50. Again, quote, The struggle for existence between human individuals is murder, and the best are not selected thereby. The struggle for existence between bodies of men is warfare, and the best are not selected thereby. The law of natural selection, which Darwin and a host of others have so clearly pointed out as the means by which the progress of animals and plants has been secured, cannot be relied upon to secure the progress of mankind. There are always too many plants born. There are always too many animals born. There are not too many human beings born into the world in the lands of the highest civilization, because the earth is not now and never has been filled with men to the limit of its capacity. The great majority are not, therefore, killed off in the struggle for existence, and there is not a small remnant of the best preserved to continue human existence and secure human progress. End quote. From Competition as a Factor in Human Evolution, American Anthropology, 1, 1888, pages 303-304. He continues to insist on this point, quote, When during late years the processes and methods of biotic evolution were clearly set forth by a host of biologists, and the theories successfully applied to all biologic sciences, it was discovered as inevitable that the same laws must apply to man as an animal. But their application was carried beyond the limits of truth. Man, as a being superior to the lower animals, was supposed to have made progress by the same laws, by the survival of the fittest. No error in philosophy could be more disastrous. And yet this statement is widely accepted. In the anthropic kingdom, evolution of arts is by invention and the selection of the labor-saving. Evolution of institutions is by invention and the selection of the just. Evolution of language is by invention and the selection of the thought-saving. Evolution of opinions is by invention and selection of the true. Human Evolution, Transaction Anthropological Society of Washington, 2, 1883, page 207. Quote, The laws of biotic evolution do not apply to mankind. There are men in the world so overwhelmed with the grandeur and truth of biotic evolution that they actually believe that man is but a two-legged beast whose progress in the world is governed by the same laws as the progress of the serpent or the wolf, and so science is put to shame. That which makes men more than beast is culture. 
Culture is human evolution, not the development of man as an animal, but the evolution of the human attributes of man. Culture is the product of human endeavor. The old grows into the new, not by natural selection, but by human selection. Proceedings of the American Society for the Advancement of Science, 38, 1889, pages 4 and 5. End of section 26. Section 27 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 27 Evolution of Music. In illustration of Powell's mature style, we might select either one of the two addresses before the Anthropological Society of Washington already referred to one being entitled From Savagery to Barbarism, 1885, the other From Barbarism to Civilization, 1886. But there is another address which exhibits even better his mannerism along with his manner. This is the address on The Evolution of Music from Dance to Symphony, which he prepared in 1889 at the mature age of 55 years for delivery on as important a public occasion as arrives in the life of an American scientist, namely, on his serving as president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science. In his constrained absence from the meeting of the association at Toronto, the address was read by his loyal representative, G.K. Gilbert. The theme of this address was the simple one that, quote, music becomes by minute increments. That is, it grows, it evolves. Such a subject might have been presented in the historic order of the discoveries on which the general conclusion is based, with abundant citation of specific examples. Indeed, this order of statement was adopted a few years later by Langley, when he, from the same chair, told in a most charming manner, quote, the history of a doctrine. Powell's method was altogether different. As usual, he gave no reference to authorities. He did not mention the name of any worker in his field, nor for that matter did he present the subject as his own. He marshaled facts and inferences in such order as pleased him for his own purpose, gathering them from the work of other students everywhere. Their variety so evidently exceeded the reach of one observer that it sufficed merely to refer them to the labors of an army of patient, earnest, keen-visioned investigators. One of the mannerisms of the address was the introduction of long series of similar statements, after the fashion already indicated, apparently with the intention of reinforcing the lesson that he wished to teach. Thus, in order to emphasize the varied conditions under which savages dance and chant, he wrote, quote, At the foot of the glaciers they have their homes, and walls of ice echo their chants. By mountain crags they have their homes, and the rocks echo their chants. In valleys they have their homes, and the savannas are filled with their chants. In tropical forests they have their homes, and the sounding aisles of the dim woods ring with their chants. End quote. Some of his hearers may have been confused with his abundance of rhetoric, yet such was the richness of his subject that he could not make a short story of it. His beginning is very simple, as if to encourage his hearers. The opening sentence is A blue egg may become a robin but in setting forth certain fundamental principles on the second page, he does not hesitate to write, quote, The third law in biotic evolution is denominated progress and heterogeneity, end quote, a statement which probably left some of his hearers behind. After explaining that musical inventions, but not musicians, 
show a survival of the fittest, he turns to the adaptation of music to environment. Quote, there is music for the dance and for the battle, music for the wedding and the funeral, music for the theater and the temple, and there is music about everything, the land, the sea, and the air, the valley and the mountain, the flower and the forest, the fountain and the river, the worm and the serpent, the zephyr and the tempest, end quote. Thus lavishing instances to the point of redundancy, as if overwhelmed with the wealth of his theme. He next points out that music is one of various arts, each of which was developed from a germ of another nature. Quote, Fetish carving was the germ of sculpture. Picture writing was the germ of painting. Mythology was the germ of the drama. The dance was the germ of music and poetry. End quote. And then as sculpture represents material forms in solid matter, and romance represents biography and history in fictitious tales, so music represents ideas in sound by rhythm, melody, harmony, and symphony. And he thus prepares the way for the question, how does music grow? Some have thought it began as a, quote, spontaneous outburst of the human soul in response to the music of the physical and animal world, the sighing of the winds, the murmur of the rills, the roaring of the cataracts, the dash of the waves on the shore, the singing of the forests, the melodies of the birds. Not so. The objective study of music among the lower tribes of mankind and among the various people of the world in different stages of culture leads to a different conclusion. End quote. Here the significant words objective study must be dwelt upon. The motive that they suggest is altogether different from that at first suggested by their context, much of which is phrased in so exuberant a style and with such a surfeit of imagined illustrations in place of specific facts that many a hearer might have taken the whole for a flight of fancy, unless these calmer words, objective study, caught his attention and led him to perceive that all the imagined illustrations are merely the generalized form of abundant observations. Although the actual origin of music has nowhere been observed, the objective study of the kinds of music found today among primitive people leads inductively to a safe generalization from which the origin of music in the unobserved past may be reasonably inferred. It began and long continued as a vocal chant in which the rhythm of sound was adapted to the rhythm of motion in the dance. The chant was at first very simple, but in time the drama came to assist in the development of more varied form. The savage deifies the beast, the stories of animal gods are dramatized, and the lives that they live are imitated. The eagle, quote, plays among the clouds, rests on the mountain tops, and soars down to circle over the waves of the sea. The hummingbird poises over its blossom cup of nectar like a winged spirit of the rainbow. The deer bounds away through the forest and leaves the hunter lost in amazement. The squirrel climbs the tree and plays about among its branches and springs from limb to limb and tree to tree and laughs at the sport. The rattlesnake glides without feet over the rocks and in his mouth the spirit of death is concealed. The trout lives in the water and flies up the brook as the hawk flies up the mountain. Dolphins play on the waves as children play on the grass. The spider spins a gossamer web. The grub is transferred into a winged beauty. The bee lays away stores of honey. The butterfly sports in the sunshine like a flower unchained from its stem. The air, the earth, and the waters are peopled with marvelous beings. 
End quote. At first the human voice chanted alone. Then through long ages of savagery and barbarism, the chant and the song that grew from it had for instrumental accompaniment only the unmusical noise of time markers or thumpers of many kinds. Instruments of sweet sound are comparatively modern. They came recently when increasing knowledge of many things led to a contemplation and an understanding of nature. Quote, the human reason has acquired a knowledge of the universe and derived exalted emotions therefrom. The boundless sea now tells its story. From Arctic and Antarctic lands, navies of icebergs forever sail, to be defeated and overwhelmed by the hot winds of the tropics. The lands with happy valleys and majestic mountains rise from the sea, built by the waves and fashioned by fire and storm. Over all rests the ambient air, moving gently in breezes, rushing madly in winds and hurling its storms against the hills and mountains of the sea and the hills and mountains of the land. Looking above the earth, the worlds of the universe are presented to view, and their wonders fill the soul. So music has come to be the language of the emotions kindled by the glories of the universe. End quote. But this part of the address confessedly advances too rapidly. The higher phases of modern music are European, and Europe, with its civilized people, is a part of the world in which Powell was not at home, as he was in the great West with its savages. It is doubtless true that, quote, as the blue egg becomes a robin, so ring around a rosy becomes a symphony, end quote. But the last stages of this evolutionary becoming need another author for their analysis. End of section 27. Section 28 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 28, Inductive Studies. In contrast to this rhapsodic address, with its imagined examples, its redundant and sometimes extravagant phrasing, and its synthetic treatment, it is desirable to make reference to Powell's inductive work, which is couched in much simpler style. An early example of this kind, already mentioned, is found in an article on Wyandotte Government, a short study of tribal society. First Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology, 1881, pages 59 to 69. This is a purely objective study of the subdivision of a group of Indians into gentes and fratries, of their method of choosing counselor and chiefs, and of the functions of their civil and military government. It is practically free from inferences and theories of origin, except in a page or two of general remarks clearly separated from the pages of more inductive treatment. Much of Powell's fundamental work seems to have been of this safe kind, but its statement was usually elided in his synthetic addresses. End of section 28. Section 29 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 29. Indian Linguistic Families Assuredly, one of the most important inductive contributions of the Bureau of Ethnology to Science is the monograph on Indian Linguistic Families, which, with the accompanying map of North America, exclusive of Mexico, was published in the Seventh Annual Report of the Bureau of Ethnology, 1891. The idea of such a monograph, accompanied by a linguistic map, had been in Powell's mind for many years, but owing to the pressure of his manifold duties, 
Its final planning and execution was entrusted to his associate, Mr. H. W. Henshaw, then in charge of the bureau under him. Gallatin had published a North American linguistic map in 1836, but the bureau map was based on a much larger body of material and followed Powell's own idea of lexic, not grammatic, classification. That is, linguistic relationship was determined for the Indian languages by similarities between single words, not by resemblances in the construction of genders and tenses. This treatment was adopted because word roots were believed to be the most permanent elements of language, while grammatic structure is but a changing phase. Indian languages to the number of several hundred, thus analyzed and compared, were grouped in stocks or families, the members of each of which show fundamental lexic similarities believed to be inherited from a common ancestral speech, while the different stocks show no relationship whatever. During the long progress of this work, some languages were set apart which had at first been placed together, and others were brought together after having been at first separated. But in the end, no fewer than 58 stocks were distinguished, all fundamentally different, not as French is from German, but as French and German are from Arabic and Hebrew. For each stock includes a group of languages, and the languages of some stocks are as diverse as the Indo-European tongues. The areas occupied by the stocks and their primitive distribution are represented by colors on the map, and the results thus graphically shown are very striking. First to be noted is the rarity of intermixed or fragmentary color areas. Second is the extraordinary contrast between the great extent of the areas of the Algonquian and Athabascan stocks and the small-scale patchwork of the stocks in the coast ranges of California. While neither Powell nor his associates regarded the map as final, it was accepted as a sufficient base for several important inferences, among them that the aboriginal tribes had long been sedentary and not nomadic, as some ethnologists have supposed, for if nomadic, the linguistic areas should show more overlapping and intermingling than is actually the case. It is only in view of this conclusion that the small areas of the California stocks can be understood, and even then it cannot be understood easily. For however sedentary the tribes of Northern California have been, it is indeed difficult to believe that they represent complete linguistic independence in closely contiguous areas of moderate relief, without resemblances by inheritance or by short-distance intermixture. Recent studies indeed suggest that a way out of this quandary may be found by grouping together certain stocks which Powell regarded as wholly independent. But whatever changes may be made in the original map, it was a great contribution to the science of American linguistics. End of section 29. Section 30 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 30 Philosophical Studies. Powell's interest in philosophical studies was early developed and long continued. As one of his friends said, he drank deep at the perennial fount of classic philosophy and had constant reference to the courses followed by the pioneers of definite thought about the east shore of the Mediterranean. It is therefore interesting to quote his three definitions of this elusive subject written in the early 80s. Quote, philosophy is the explanation of the phenomena of the universe. End quote. Philosophical Bearings of Darwinism, Washington, 1882. Quote, Philosophy is the science of opinion. End quote. 
Three Methods of Evolution, Bulletin of the Philosophical Society of Washington, 6, 1883, page 30. And, quote, A philosophy is a system of opinions concerning the phenomena of the universe, which the people entertaining such opinions have observed. End quote. Human Evolution, Transaction of the Anthropological Society of Washington, 2, 1883, page 181. How significant it is that the emphasis is shifted from the objective phenomena of the universe in the first definition to the subjective science of opinion in the second, and that the single science of opinion suggested in the second definition should be replaced by an implied multitude of such sciences in the third. Powell's epigrammatic rendering of the contrast between the philosophies of savagery and civilization have already been quoted. He naturally found little value in metaphysics, which he rightly viewed as the very opposite of science, and hence erroneous. The error of the metaphysic philosophy, he said, was the assumption that the great truths, or major propositions, were already known by mankind, and that by the proper use of the logical machine, all minor truths could be discovered and all errors eliminated from philosophy. On the contrary, quote, it is found that in the course of the evolution of mind, minor propositions are discovered first, and major propositions are reached only by the combination of minor propositions, that always in the search for truth, the minor proposition comes first, and that no major proposition can ever be accepted until the minor propositions included therein have been demonstrated. As the metaphysic methods of reasoning were strong, metaphysic philosophies were false. The body of metaphysic philosophy is a phantasmagoria. End quote. The Philosophic Bearings of Darwinism, page 6. During the earlier years in which these passages were written, Powell's philosophical studies were subordinate to his work in ethnology. In later years, philosophy came to have a more dominant interest and at times so fully occupied his thoughts that in a lecture of apparent ethnological content, as indicated by its title, Relation of Primitive People to Environment, Illustrated by American Examples, Smithsonian Institution Report, 1895, pages 625 to 637, he devoted a good share of his hour to an abstract consideration of the difference between quality and property. It was in these later years that he sought, as others had done before him, to establish a fully logical foundation for mechanics, and reached the conclusion that motion, either molar or molecular, is constant in quantity, but may be deflected in direction. But his use of words in this connection was sometimes such that it was not easy to follow his meaning. He wrote, for example, quote, When motion becomes energy, then speed becomes inertia, and path becomes velocity. And when time becomes causation, then persistence becomes state, and change becomes event, end quote. Bureau of Ethnology, 19th Annual Report, 1900, pages 56 and 57. In another direction, he went so far as to conceive consciousness as one of the primary attributes of the particle. It would seem here as if, in the effort to know the unknown, he had reverted from the philosophy of civilization to that of savagery. It is indeed curious to find that one long practiced in observational sciences, and who had years before recognized the necessarily large subjective element in all philosophies, should at last persuade himself that, in a matter so recondite as the primary attributes of the particle, 
his mental concepts were really the true counterparts of external nature, from however much cogitation they had sprung. End of section 30. Section 31 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 31 Pentalogic Series. During the eight years that elapsed between Powell's resignation from the directorship of the Geological Survey in 1894 and his death in 1902, a subject that attracted him greatly was the study of human activities, familiar matters for the most part, so that his explicit statement of them sometimes seemed like the unnecessary formulation of the commonplace. But his object here must have been to bring even familiar matters to conscious attention and to discover in them their essential and wonderful nature, especially wonderful when they are viewed as products of long-continued evolution. It was as if Powell wished to arouse us from our indifference to everyday affairs and to place them objectively in the great procession of the world's march with all the dignity belonging to their ancient origin. Such seem to be the motives underlying his study of the pentalogic series of human activities, in which he classed everything connected with man's pleasures, industries, institutions, languages, and opinions. He saw that the study of these activities gave rise to five sciences, esthetology, technology, sociology, philology, and sophiology, each of which is again divided. For example, sophiology, or the science of instruction, contains five arts, nurture, oratory, education, publication, and research. So fully was Powell convinced of the value of his pentalogic scheme that for a time his administrative reports on the investigations conducted in the Bureau of Ethnology were divided according to it, although this required the division of one man's work under different headings. End of section 31 Section 32 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 32 Truth and Error. Reflection upon these broad subjects seems to have developed the ambition to systematize all accumulated knowledge and philosophies from those of the savage and lower barbarian to those of the modern scientific world, thus framing a cosmic compendium at once broader and simpler than any previously conceived. He was in this way carried from the concrete study of human races to the more and more abstract study of human thought. The field that he sought to cover was more extensive than any that he had previously cultivated, and it is to be questioned whether so vast an ambition was not less a sign of continued strength than of approaching weakness. He planned to arrange the entire content of knowledge in a system of three parts, the first to deal with nature, the second with man, and the third with mind, and with a view to giving his results a general and hence permanent character, the work was given the form of a trilogy, and was modeled after artistic rather than technical standards. The first part of this heavy undertaking was published under the title of Truth and Error, or The Science of Intellection, 1898. The second part appeared in a series of papers in the American Anthropologist, having for titles the names of the Pentalogic series given above and designed for reprinting with additions under the name of Good and Evil, 
the third part was left unfinished. A devotedly loyal disciple of Powell's says of this work, quote, The breadth and depth of its foundations were little realized by co-workers, still less by the critics of the preliminary essays. Indeed, the modesty of the author seldom permitted him to see in its full magnitude the mighty task to which he was impelled by the same powerful instinct that inspired his military and exploratory efforts. End quote. But the same disciple went so far in eulogizing his master that we must prefer the estimate of another of Powell's intimates, a man of more even balance, who formed his judgment without overweight of admiration, and who wrote of his friend, quote, his philosophic writings belong to a field in which thought has ever found language inadequate, and are for the present, so far as may be judged from reviews of truth and error, largely misunderstood. Admitting myself to be one of those who fail to understand much of his philosophy, I do not therefore condemn it as worthless, for in other fields of his thought, events have proved that he was not visionary, but merely in advance of his time. End quote. It is sad to close the record of an earnest life with an account of plans unfinished and unfinishable, rather than with a record of labors brought to a well-rounded close. It is sadder still to follow a leader to a point where his leading is not followed, where his latest thoughts, instead of remaining the inspiration and foundation of new studies, are passed over in silence by the generation that follows him. But for these reflections there are two consolations. One is the contemplation of the great and enduring work that the leader accomplished in years of fuller strength, and of that some record is here set forth. The other is the loving memory in which he is held by his many friends. Two of these may here speak, as they did at a meeting commemorative of Powell's services, held under the auspices of the Washington Academy of Sciences on February 16, 1903. End of section 32. Section 33 of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell, 1834 to 1902, by William Morris Davis. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Section 33 Personal Estimates Powell's longtime friend and trusted fellow worker, G. K. Gilbert, from whose address the last preceding quotation is taken, said also, quote, The glow of his enthusiasm, the illumination of his broad philosophy, the warmth of his friendship are still with us and we should be either more or less than human to divest ourselves so soon of the influence of his inspiring personality. It was through this personality, too, that he accomplished much of his work for science. Gathering about him the ablest man he could secure, he was yet always the intellectual leader, and few of his colleagues could withstand the influence of his master mind. Phenomenally fertile in ideas, he was absolutely free in their communication, with the result that many of his suggestions, a number which never can be known, were unconsciously appropriated by his associates and incorporated in their published results. The scientific product, which he directly and indirectly inspired, may equal or even exceed that which stands in his own name." End quote. The secretary of the Smithsonian Institution, S. P. Langley, spoke of Powell in part as follows, quote, Wherever I have been with him, in whatever surroundings, I think I have been more impressed with the simplicity and self-comprised nature of his character than even with the complexity of his knowledge and achievement. He was to me not so much one of the common figures of daily life, as one of Plutarch's men, sincere he was, and truthful to the point of being unable to bring himself to hint the thing which is not, 
nor even to allow the shadow of deceit in his ways. Such sincerity, existing in his own heart, begat a confidence in others which did not always meet its just return. He was a generous man, kind to others and helpful, a combative and a brave, and always a self-contained man, who found in himself counsel sufficient for his need. He was a truthful and steadfast man, and one who never deserted a friend. End quote. Powell died at his summer home at Haven, Maine, on September 23, 1902, in his 69th year. End of section 33. Recording by Melanie Schleter McKelmont, Madison, Wisconsin, on the web at melanie.mckelmont.org. End of Biographical Memoir of John Wesley Powell. 1834 to 1902 by William Morris Davis